So good evening to you all. On behalf of uh, ICTS as well as Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium, I extend a very warm welcome to you, people who have assembled here in person and people who have joined us online. So a warm welcome to you all. And uh, we have a very interesting talk today by Professor Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan from ICTS on ways of computing. So there are a, a few interactive activities as well along the course of the talk. So it should be all in all a very interesting one. Uh, and before we get started with the introduction to the speaker, uh, I request uh, Professor uh, uh, Gopakumar, uh, Director of ICTS, to say a few words. Uh, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Madhusudan, and uh, welcome all of you again uh, to uh, to the copy with curiosity. I'm very glad that it is uh, back in person, uh, though many people I am sure are also joining in uh, on YouTube. Uh, I think it's uh, it's great to have uh, Professor Radhakrishnan, who is our own member from ICTS, uh, speak today. I can tell you that he's a very engaging speaker, and he really uh, brings a subject kind of both alive and very uh, tangibly to uh, uh, brings it across. So I'm sure you have a treat in front of you. Uh, I think uh, many of you are probably following many other ICTS outreach events. So please, if you have, uh, if I would urge you to even subscribe to our ICTS YouTube channel, ICTS Talks, where you can see a lot of past uh, uh, past outreach lectures and other activities. We have a very wide number of them, including another series called Vigyanadda, which is purely online uh, uh, and is meant for, uh, it's at a slightly more uh, uh, advanced level compared to Copy with Curiosity and is meant to give you a bit more of a taste of uh, some of the uh, exciting areas of research. I think Sitadi gave one of these uh, most recently. Uh, so in any case, uh, I invite you to check out ICTS's webpage. There's a lot of resources there, and uh, I look forward to your continuing engagement with this series, The Copy with Curiosity. Uh, let me also thank the planetarium, uh, Dr. Pramod, Dr. Madhusudan, and so on for uh, uh, being with us for the last six, seven years uh, and uh, helping to create this uh, very nice uh, activity. So now I'll uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Sittadi Roy from ICTS uh, who, will, uh, who will introduce the speaker. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, and thanks all of you for coming. Thanks to all of you who have joined online. So it's an absolute uh, pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Jaikumar Radhakrishnan. Um, so Jaikumar Radhakrishnan, uh, at least formally, is a computer scientist, but I think uh, his depth of knowledge about uh, computer science, uh, physics, mathematics in general is, is amazing, and it's always great to have him around. So Professor Jaikumar Radhakrishnan started off as a computer scientist, did his PhD, uh, in 1991, I guess, in Rutgers, and after that, uh, he moved to TI for Mumbai, where um, he was uh, in the computer science department. Uh, it's called the School of Technology and Computer Science, uh, and for the last year or so, he has been there as well as at ICTS Bangalore. Uh, his main interests lie in um, complexity, randomness in uh, computation, information theory, and I think more recently, quantum computation and information. So uh, with that, I'd uh, give Jaikumar Radhakrishnan to you. But before that, may I ask uh, Professor Vadia to uh, please hand over a small memento to uh, Professor Radhakrishnan. Thank you, Professor Vadia. And uh, Professor Radhakrishnan, the stage is yours. Thank you, uh, Sitadi, for the introduction, and uh, yeah, uh, I thank the planetarium for all the arrangements, and, uh, and thank you all for coming. So uh, today's talk will be a mixture of a few things. Um, 
primarily uh, I'll just give you three examples. Yeah. So I I should stand at a particular place. Or, yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, I'll just give you three examples. Uh, there is more to be said about these examples, but I'll just let you think about it and then we'll see. If you have some questions, maybe I can answer, maybe someone else can answer. Okay. So the plan, so how does this work? Yes, yeah, so let's suppose. Okay. Yeah. So the plan is I'll give you three examples. One of them is about computing shortest paths in networks. And this will be something where we will do a little physics experiment. It's kind of, yeah, it's almost, it's a very ordinary physics experiment. And from that, we will try to justify a famous algorithm in computer science, okay. And the second problem is a problem about matching nuts and bolts. And I'll tell you about the problem. And then we will see that somehow randomness helps us solve the problem faster, or at least more somewhat simply compared to deterministic methods, okay. And then I want to tell you about a role, a place where randomness really is important, and that is in a cryptographic application. And many of you have probably heard of zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. So we will have a little demonstration with paper and scissors of a zero knowledge proof. And uh, then we'll see, yeah. So uh, at any stage, uh, feel free to uh, you know, stop me, ask me. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Okay. So the problem is this you have a sort of map and I have not really drawn a map but this is some schematic of a map. There is this ICTS and there are various locations and the, they are connected by links and these links have a number on them. You can think of the number either as the length of the path between those locations in some units or the cost of traveling, you know, the bus ticket, or it could be the time it takes. It's not very important. And our goal is to find out what is the best way of getting from uh, ICTS to each of these locations. Yeah. So there are multiple paths, and you could try them and see uh, how much. Um, each path costs, yeah. Now, one thing is, I mean, this is a small enough graph and one might be tempted to say that, okay, from ICTS, I will try this path and this other path and try various paths and see how much each of them costs and among them take the best path, okay. Uh, that is the definition of shortest path. Among all paths, which path gives the best cost, okay. Now, maybe in this network, it is feasible, it's a small network, but if you had a thousand nodes, yeah, uh, how would you go about doing this? Even for small networks, um, the number of paths from a source to a destination, you know, uh, so suppose this is your source and this is your destination. And you could take this path, you could take the other path. So if there are n such stages, the number of paths will grow exponentially in n. Okay. So just saying that I'll try all paths is definitely not the right strategy, even if you have a computer. Okay. So what should we do? So I'm going to change tracks and suddenly talk about a physics experiment. So here is what I propose to do. In each of these locations, yeah, for each of these locations, I will have a little ball, yeah, and I will connect these balls by little ribbons 
or strings and the length of that string will be measured and will be equal to whatever was the length here. So, there is a ball called m, there is a ball with label i and there is a string of length 3 connecting them. Okay. And actually we did this yesterday and this is my office and uh, this these ribbons and all have been laid out. I mean, it is very pretty, yeah. And uh, I think this ball is the ICTS ball, uh, the by that I mean corresponding to this location, okay. So now, I mean, it looks like I have made the problem harder by putting all these flexible <laughs> things there. So what I have done now is I have placed everything in a heap, okay, so made it even worse, okay. So there were all these balls connected by ribbons of various sizes and now I have heaped them up, yeah. And now what I propose to do is lift the ball corresponding to ICTS, okay. So let me do it, yeah, we are ready, yeah. So I lift it and this is the ICTS ball, there is a label here and it says ICTS 0 because the distance from ICTS to ICTS is 0, yeah. And then as I lift, at some point, some other ball starts rising. Now let us try to guess which ball would have risen, yeah. So you can either look at this picture or here, yes. So this ICTS is now rising. And then there are neighboring balls here which it is attached to and at some point ICTS pulls one of them off the ground, off the table. And the first one it will pull will be E, yeah, so good. And then as I pull more, yeah, some other balls are rising, yes, and I pull and pull and pull and pull and all the balls nicely arrange themselves here. Yeah, one second, let me tie this here. Okay, so we have all these balls arranged and what do you think has happened, yeah? So ICTS is the topmost ball, it has gone way up, yeah. And then there are these other balls. There seem to be two balls roughly at the same distance here, yeah. We will see, or three of them. Yeah. Okay. So there is this two, and then the next thing that rises will be B and J, yes. And then after some time, maybe A, B will pull A up, but simultaneously ICTS is pulling I up, yes? So, but there was, I thought one more. Sorry, which one? Ah, this, this one, right? So E is pull, e, e, e was the pink ball which rose up first and then it pulls up F, okay. And we do this and if you think about it, if you measure the distance from ICTS to a ball, as soon as it rises, after that their distance remains constant. Yeah, they rise simultaneously. That distance is the shortest distance. Is this uh, convincing, obvious, totally obvious? So what has, has gravity done? It has examined all the paths in that network exponentially, many of them, and it has figured out the answer for us. Okay, not a very complicated experiment, yeah. So, yeah. Good. So this is what we have all agreed. After the ball representing a location has risen, we measure its distance from the ball representing ICTS and that represents the shortest path, okay. So this is some sort of a computer which has solved the shortest path problem for this specific, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it has solved this problem. A computer is supposed to be a general purpose thing, solves other problems, yeah. 
Okay. So, so let's just, I'll just put out these questions. Uh, one of them I already said. Did nature examine all paths and come up with the best path for each of them? And could we have predicted the outcome with pen and paper? You seem to have already <laughs> done it better than me. Yeah. So what happens, let us just go over it. So as ICTS rises, yeah, so these two links become tight, those two. So actually my red ribbons here are the ones which are carrying tension. The yellow ribbons are all limp, yeah. The, so, so every ball has a little red ribbon that is, that is holding it up and this is holding this, yeah. So this was, it is labeled, uh, what did you say, E, E, and this one is labeled F. And then F is pulling up uh, G, yeah, and so on. So by just examining which of these ribbons are actually carrying the tension, we actually know the shortest path. So let me do it on the board. So, so as ICTS rises, this J and this, this rise, at this point, A expects to rise when ICTS has reached a height of five from the table, yeah. And this I, sorry, this A, this I, yeah, sorry, the first thing that rises rose was this, then these two, and then this will rise. This will rise and this will rise. Now at this point, all the other nodes can develop an expectation based looking at their neighbors about when they can expect to rise. For example, this M says, well, I has just risen at time five or in five when I, when ICTS was at height five. So I can rise presumably when ICTS gets to height eight, unless some new development occurs, okay? So it's current expectation, tentative hope is eight, yeah? Similarly, for example, this, this says, well, already A rose when it was five, so H can expect to rise at time uh, 10, uh, at height 10, and so on, yeah, G's, tentative distance becomes two plus three plus two, yeah, seven, and so on, okay. So, uh, so let us just do it. So which is the one which is going to uh, rise up next after this? So, yeah, this one rises at seven. Is there somebody who rises up even early, earlier? Sorry? G will rise. So G's current distance has become uh, seven. Yeah, and then M is at eight. Sorry, I haven't labeled C. ICTS to C, yeah, what, what was, what was it? it I, Six, so that would have risen even earlier, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, so right now, th this, this is at distance eight, right? Yeah. Which one? F. Yeah, so F has risen, pulled by E, and then G rose, yeah, so that distance now, its distance was eight, I think, yeah, seven. And this one was eight. Yeah, and then, okay, so this one's distance is what? 10, I mean, tentative distance is 10. Is there anybody who is able to do better than 10? No? So then this rises and maybe if, so at this point, L before this rose, yeah, 
L had an expectation of 13. But the moment this rose, it flips and it, its best expectation is from H, okay? And yeah, and finally, this gives you 12, whereas this gives 13. So, oh sorry, before that, this goes up at 11 and this goes up at 12 or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. So, what I have drawn with these wavy lines here are the red ribbons. Okay, they were the ones that were involved in pulling this up. Okay. So, that's it, yeah. And this is source of a famous algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay. So, what is Dijkstra's algorithm? Whatever we did here, yeah, by imagining this experiment, you don't kind of, in each time you have to find the network, you don't like start looking for ribbon and balls. You just imagine what would happen, okay? And what, what you do is that at any stage, yes, yeah, so let me show it here. So, maybe this, yeah. So, there are these nodes which have turned green. Green means it has risen, okay? And orange are those which have some neighbor among the green fellows. And each of those orange nodes looks at its green neighbors and finds out the best distance that it can get because the green people know their distance, okay? So it asks them and it computes the distance. And then we look at all the orange nodes and among them, whoever has the smallest tentative distance is now made permanent that orange will now turn into green. And once it turns into green, its neighbors start getting excited. Because, you know, we, they know that this is, is rising and at some point it's going to pull. But it could be that somebody else who is about to rise later will actually provide a better path, which is sort of what happened here. Yeah, M seems to have risen, but then this length was so much more than this that a later rise of H actually provided the shortest path for L, okay? So, this way we keep a series of colored nodes, green nodes, orange nodes, and the red nodes with a red border. Red border people are very far away from action. Nothing is happening in their neighborhood, yeah, yeah. And then as these orange things move in and in into the green region, at some point the whole graph becomes green and everybody's distance has been determined. Okay, and this is called Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so keep this. So you see, there is no exponential blow up. With each step, one new vertex, one new node went from lying on the table to rising up. So if your, if your network had, so yeah, so maybe we should, oh, yeah. If your network had about, say, n, nodes and M links, it turns out you can write a program for this very systematically keeping data for orange nodes, red nodes, green nodes and which node pulled me up, that is, which is the red ribbon which pulled me up, just keep track of that and in the end you would have produced this network of wavy lines which this is called the shortest path tree. Yeah, it's a tree, the shortest path tree out of this node ICP. Okay. Yeah. All right, so this was one example I wanted to give. Yeah, so it's a computer science example, but it's all based on this. Um, the way I have stated it and the way this experiment has been performed, uh, the red ribbons can pull either way, like whether this rises first or this rises first, the other node gets pulled. Now, uh, why am I saying this? Uh, in Bangalore, we have roads that are one way, yeah? So, uh, will this algorithm work if there are one way uh, paths that is that can be traversed only in this direction? Now, it's kind of hard for me to imagine a ribbon 
which when pulled this way will pull the other node, but when pulled the other way will not pull, okay. So maybe it is not very easy for us to imagine a physics experiment, but we should not be constrained by physics, okay. So we can directly ask whether this algorithm will work. Now what is an algorithm? So when some ball rises, you look at an orange ball which is still lying on the table and if the link goes from a risen ball to this ball, then you update the distance. If the link is going the other way, you do not update. Okay. The link must be traveling in the right direction. So that is a little bit of thinking you will do while programming, but even though this experiment is not applicable, this principle seems to be more generally applicable even when the network has one way edges, okay. So I will let you think about it. Okay, so that is all I wanted to say about Dijkstra's algorithm. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, okay, very good. So actually let us see what really happened when ICTS rose, yeah. So what was happening as it was rising, every, I am just imagining that this ribbon is made out of molecules, yeah. And every molecule is feeling a little tug, yeah. And that molecule is trans uh, transferring the tug to a neighboring molecule and so on, okay. So if you really wanted to simulate this experiment, I do not know how many millions of molecules and probably each of these is subdivided into little. So there are forces that are being transmitted as ICTS rises and while these particles are still on the table, they do not feel the force, only when the distance reaches a certain level, they start feeling the force. But what we do is we sort of shortcut, that is we say that the transmissions along this, we are not going to wait for each particle in our, while thinking about it to transmit it to the next, we will just ask when is the next important event going to happen, okay. But the event comes from this experiment, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I understand that I am not using optimization of physics or minimizing of potential energy which is probably what you had in mind, but uh, yeah, so, so that, yeah, so in that case it is, in that sense it is not directly related to the physics. Question. Yeah. Uh, sir, I am struggling to think what would be the physical analog if the length is negative? If the cost is negative cost, like anyway finding shortest path is difficult yes. in that case, but what would be the physical analog? Yeah, so, so I have no idea of a physical analog connected to this thing directly. Now this particular algorithm uh, does not work if there are edges with negative costs yeah, or negative uh, distances. But uh, thank you for the question. It is a very important uh, question of finding shortest paths. Uh, yeah, you want to have a suggestion? So you please complete that then I will ask. Uh, you have one more. Wonderful. Yeah. So, but the question is, are there realistic problems where negative costs show up? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it is, uh, here is a problem. So, suppose. These nodes uh, refer to international currencies, okay. So the Indian rupee is here, uh, maybe the Bangladeshi taka, uh, yeah, and US dollar, and what I don't know, the British pound, yeah, and so on, yeah, Russian ruble, yeah, or whatever it's called, yeah. And there are people in the currency market who are giving us a rate for converting one rupee into a British pound, yeah. So the rates are mentioned, yeah, I do not know, these are not realistic numbers, so do not <laughs> bring your pounds to me, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. And these numbers are mentioned, sometimes they are big, sometimes, yeah. So from US dollar to Indian rupee, I do not know, I, I do not know, 80, 90, I do not. So these numbers are mentioned. 
And now I want to convert my Indian rupee to Russian rubles. So which path should I take? In which order should I convert them so that I get the maximum value? So the only thing is that it sort of looks like this. I want to find the best path. The word best still up appears. Except when I take a particular path, I am not interested in the sum of the rates, but the product, product of the rates. Now, is there something that can convert product to sums? Logarithms. So, it is the same problem, just replace these rates by their logarithms and then find the shortest path. Logarithm of point 0.1, negative number, yeah. So, I mean the problem is important, but we cannot rig up an experiment like this and deal with it. So, in some situation, there is a different algorithm, yeah. In the, in, the, in the shortest path, if I, so uh, we could add overall constants to each edge you are saying or to, uh, then the products or the sums will not be the same. Some will depend on how many legs you have. Yeah, so if you're, exactly. Yeah, you have to correct for that and then, uh, but yeah, there are ideas similar to yours of converting a network with negative costs to completely positive, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a valid question. Uh, so it turns out that there is another algorithm called the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which can deal with situations where uh, you have negative costs. But you know, it cannot deal with situations where there is a negative weight cycle. Yeah, but you know, uh, if you have a negative weight cycle, you have this very happy situation where you can keep converting. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, making lots of money and apparently such uh, discrepancies happen in the currency market for a fraction of a second and there are people who sit around watching for it and converting their money quickly to make uh, more out of less, okay. Arbitrage problem, sure. yeah. Question. So this is one of the theorems or one of the algorithms which we have for finding the shortest path. In this family or in this category, how many such algorithms are actually there apart from the just uh, Dijkstra's algorithm? Dijkstra's algorithm, yeah. Yeah. So there are, uh, so I don't know the number, but there are many algorithms like Johnson's algorithm, Bellman Ford, Dijkstra, yeah. And there are, there is work even recently, like in the last two or three years, where for sparse networks, you can do somewhat better. Uh, there is another algorithm which many of you might have heard in context of AI, which is called the A star algorithm. Yeah, it's called A star. So there, in addition to the actual lengths, every node has a sense of, so first of all, we are trying to find the shortest path from an initial source to a particular destination, okay? So from ICTS, suppose I start, yeah, and I want to get to the planetarium. Now, each of the nodes that appears in between has some sort of an estimate, okay, a lower bound for its actual distance to the planetarium. For example, the actual distance may be a certain number of kilometers, but if I looked at the straight line, that straight line is always a lower bound for this. So from ICTS, there may be good locations north which are very close. But I know there is no point going in that direction because I need to get to the planetarium because they are saying that their estimate for the final distance is even worse than the distance for ICTS. So such information is often exploited mm -hmm. uh, to speed up uh, finding shortest paths. Yeah. Question. So this is for one is to one. So if I want to get from ICTS to point L, I can use this. Yes. But if I want to get from ICTS to point K and from point K I want to get to point H, then what is that? Is it like uh, I have to repeat the process again this time with K as the point? How or is there some 
better way so to do it. Yes, there is an algorithm again, which does all pairs shortest paths. So you give it a graph, it will give you a matrix indexed by rows and columns and it will tell you for each pair what is the shortest distance. Now if you want to start from ICTS and what do they, in, in these apps they say add a, add an intermediate location in your, what called, what's it? Stop. stop, add a stop, add a stop, yeah. So you want to go from ICTS to K but you want to stop at G. So you would presumably find the shortest path to G followed by the shortest path from G to K, okay. I mean, th this is very idealized, I mean, re in real life there are other considerations, so. Okay. Yes. I take ICTS as the center point and then calculate the minimum Short. distance to all the points. Let yes. us say there are 10 points. Yes. So I have sum it up. Yes. And say I get 100. Yes. Now if I change from ICTS to any other location, say M or I or K, and then do the same lifting or experiment, yes. will the sum of the minimum distances be the same or will it be different? Can we predict it? Uh, well, uh, this, it turns out that the all pairs shortest path can be computed, so you can. can compute. Yeah. Will the minimum of all, the sum of the distances from any point be the same for a given graph? Uh, if so, can we predict it? No, so uh, to the first question, if, you, if the graph was a star graph, clearly from here, everybody's distance is like one unit. So if there are n nodes outside the hub, it is n. But from this node, if, it will be like two times n because almost everybody needs two hops, okay. So it's not the same for all nodes, yeah. But the question is then, so this is like modern literature, the facility location problem. So you want to build a fire station. Where in the city should you locate the fire station so that maybe the maximum distance to somebody is minimized or which is called the median point of the graph or the sum of the distances is minimized, especially not for fire station, but suppose you have a gas agency and you might have to supply gas. So where should you locate your whatever depot so that, so those are all questions which are addressed in this family of problems, not this problem particularly. Question? Okay, yeah. So I'm a little slow, but please uh, keep asking, yeah. Okay. So the next, so I, this was one problem. Yeah, it was interesting, yeah, I think. Okay. So, yeah, so this is a problem of nuts and bolts. Yeah, I want to, so yeah, it's a completely new thing, yeah. So you're given a certain number of nuts and bolts and um, they're all of different sizes, okay. And they've not been screwed in, they've been put on the table. And for each uh, nut, we want to find the bolt which matches it. There is only one, they are all of different sizes. Now, yeah, so you can either think of it as nuts and bolts or a lock and key. Um, they all have different locks and you have to find out which key matches. I mean, this is an experience all of us have had just before going to a train, you, yeah, you want a lock, you know you have 10 of them, but you can't find the right key for them. Or I don't know if this is common, but my mother has a problem with her that ear stud also, like she will just give me and say find one, yeah, because the right one doesn't uh, fit, yeah, okay. So anyway, so yeah, now the question is what should we do? Is there an algorithm to solve this uh, problem? Yeah, so you've been given n nuts, n bolts, they are all of different sizes. Yeah. So one thing we could do, so if the nuts themselves could be compared with each other, yeah. So I don't have nuts and bolts, but uh, I have these cards and they stand for uh, nuts. The red cards are for nuts and the uh, blue cards here are for bolts, okay. And uh, I have a computer program which will tell, I can tell, ask it to compare this nut and bolt. It will say no, the nut is too big or the bolt is too big or you found the match. 
okay. So there will be a program which will do this. And then how do we, yeah, so how do we, um, so what, what method do we use for matching them up? Okay, so that's the question. So what I have said here is that if somehow we could compare the nuts against each other, then we could just arrange the nuts so by repeatedly asking, so how do you arrange it? So suppose you take A and B and somebody says, no, B is smaller than A, meaning that program says that the nut B is smaller than nut A, you keep it here. And then the next one, you maybe compare it with A, it says smaller, then you compare it with B, it is bigger, and then you put it here perhaps, yeah. And the next one, you, yeah, so you have somehow managed to arrange them in some order, yeah. And whenever a new one comes, one thing is you could sequentially compare it with all of them, but by now all of you have seen this, the right thing to do is compare it with the middle, then like we do in a dictionary, so that, so if there are n, what were these called, nuts already arranged, when a new nut comes, you will need about log n steps to find its position. Okay, is this clear? Each comparison halves the range, halves the range, halves the range, either you go left, right, left, right, and finally you find the position. Okay, so in about, uh, yeah, so if we could sort, yeah, so, so this method of sorting would manage, will allow us to do it in about n log n steps, yeah, so there is a constant involved, but don't worry, yeah, maybe log to the base 2 because you are halving each time, something like that, okay. But uh, the problem is that uh, we can't, we are not allowed to compare two things and because, yeah, we, we can compare only a nut against a bolt, yeah. Otherwise, I would have sorted all the nuts in n log n time, sorted all the bolts in n log n time then the biggest one matches the biggest one, the biggest one matches the biggest one, the next biggest one, and so on, and I would be done, okay. But the problem now is I cannot do that. So what should one do, yeah? And uh, there are, so let me just say two strategies. Yeah. So, so I cannot sort them, so, I pick a random nut and I go through all the bolts until I find its match, okay. And I put them aside. Then I take the next nut in a random order, I examine them, yeah. So suppose there are about, at any time, suppose there are k nuts here, sorry, k bolts still here and a new nut has come and I am shuffling these and comparing, roughly in how many? So, in the worst case, maybe its match is the last one. If you are very lucky, it will be the first one. On an average, it will be somewhere in the middle, k over 2, yeah. So, the total number of comparisons, yeah, that you will need will be about n squared over 4. On an average, you perform about, yeah, yeah. So, if, yeah, so it will be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, but half of that. Okay, so this, this method takes something like n squared steps. But you know, this was 2n log n, our dream, which doesn't work, was 2n log n. Is there something we could do here which would match this n log n or 2n log n or something like that? And uh, here's a strategy. The second strategy, the trick is, and I mean if I had given you some more time, maybe you would have figured it out yourself, okay. So you pick a random, pick a nut at random, yeah, and 
you compare it with all the bolts. But you are not looking only for the match. Those that are bigger, you keep on one side. Those that are smaller, you keep on the other side until you find its match. So this M, maybe it got matched with D or something that is kept in the middle. Those that were smaller than M, yeah, M was a nut. Those bolts that were smaller than M are kept on this side. Those bolts that are bigger than M are kept on this side. Okay. And now I have to split the bolts also like that. But I have found the match for this guy. I compare this with, so is, is it clear? Yeah. I, so I am not saying it very well. So because I do not know which one I am calling bolt and which one is nut. Okay. Yeah. So this is a bolt, this is a nut. Yeah. So I first found its match. Yes. And then, but while I was finding its match, I went through the entire list. It may be that I found this D very early. Do not stop and celebrate. Okay. Go through all of them. Those that are smaller, those blues which are smaller, put on this side. Those blues which are big, they put on this side. Okay. And then you have found its match. Use it as a proxy to now look at the other reds and put them on this side or that side. There will be equal number, equal number of blues and reds on this side an equal number of blues and reds on this side because I initially promised that there is a match for everybody. Is that clear? And now you repeat the problem on this and repeat the problem on this. Okay. Again, what do you do? Pick one at random. If you had not picked one at random, you might have been stuck with a worst case choice. Maybe this was the smallest of, uh, sorry, this was the smallest of the nuts yeah and again all everybody is turned out bigger but the point is that if you pick, pick things at random the chance is that you won't be at the two ends you will be equally distributed among them and on an average you will be splitting up this pile equally okay so uh, i have a little like program to demonstrate this but actually i'm running out of out of time and the other reason is that if you do all this yeah the method that i just suggested so this is for those of you who have done a computer programming course this is like quick sort what you might have heard like quick sort but in quick sort you are allowed to compare two numbers here a nut can be compared only against a bolt okay but somehow you finesse it by first finding the partner and then doing this. So if you did that, the total time taken would be something like 4 times n log n. The expected, I might have written it somewhere. Yeah, so I have written it at the bottom here. The time taken is about 4 times n log n, whereas this is like n squared over 4. And the point is that as n becomes large, Yeah. The n squared as a function, n squared by 4 grows like this, whereas n log n, yeah, do not worry about 0, grows much more gently. Okay. So for large problems, say if you had 1000 nuts and 1000 bolts to match, then this method is, yeah, this method with 4 times n log n is actually the superior method. Okay. So you made use of randomness to do this. and the question is, is there a deterministic method for doing this? Yeah, so I do not want to use random question. Yeah. Yes, so I do not know if uh, the immune system is sort, uh, separating them in things into two parts. It must be following something very efficient. No, so even our DNAs, they have like matches and things like this. So I'm sure if I knew more biology, I would have suggested a biology experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's sort of similar in the sense that if you had, uh, like you said, N keys yes. and N, N locks, then there's no immediate comparison in some sense uh, between 
keys or between locks. Yeah. Let's say we are they are more or less identical. Locks. More or less, yeah. But if yeah. you could tell, but nuts and bolts, you There's can always a, feel a little play when you. If the nut is a little right. big, you can see right. that it is shaking, etc. So, but if you don't have that, then it becomes then it becomes hopeless. Then it becomes hopeless. You, the whole thing was that the first strategy where you just went for the match, it overlooked the size information. It was just looking for its match and then, but if you don't overlook the size information and do it slightly more cleverly, you can do this. Okay. But the question is that this was randomized and it was very important. So, Anupam, we will not do the actual simulation. Yeah. So, but if, uh, sorry, what was I saying? Yeah, so suppose I wanted a deterministic solution. Yeah. So, I don't want randomness. I want a method which guarantees that in a certain amount of time, the problem is solved. All this average business is not good. I want guarantees. Yeah. Always end global. Now, this was an open problem for a very long time. And today, or maybe like in 1995, uh, using rather heavy machinery, uh, showed that there is also a deterministic solution for this problem using things which are like expander graphs, which you might have heard about, et cetera, okay. But still, the, the simplicity of the random algorithm is very appealing and I wanted you to appreciate that, that you just do this randomly and on average, you'll be doing very well and that is provable. Question? No, no, it's not really an experiment. It, th th there is a website here which, when presented two cards, tells me which one is bigger or which one is smaller. And I was planning to take 20 cards and show how the, I, I find the match, okay? The real reason I didn't do it is that actually for 20, this n squared by 4 is actually superior to 4n log n. <laughs> so, unless I go to something like 100 or something, this so-called method that I'm praising, yeah? It doesn't uh, beat this method, okay? So, uh, it is worth doing, but it, it's not like, you know, a solid proof of concept or anything. But certainly you can do the calculation or run a simulation for 1000 and this algorithm will beat the other one. Follow. Oh, it will be like um, 1000 and log n like a huge, it will be n log n, but the constant in front will be like a nasty constant. Okay. That's not the no, no, it's a constant. How much is yeah, so I don't know, but, uh, and nobody bothers because they know it's very bad, so don't calculate. Yeah, but. That constant is same. Uh, At n equals billion, it will probably beat this. n squared by four, definitely, okay? Yeah, the, it's a fixed constant times n log n. That's mm -hmm. the answer to your question. Yeah. It's almost philosophical. Sometimes it's better to be random than trying to be deterministic. That is true. And very, our next example will be one where randomness is essential. But I would still like to address uh, this question. See, once you have found the matches, which is what you wanted, then you can go home with the solution, okay? The fact that you used a random solution to get at it, nobody is going to, you know, I mean, like some school teachers say, oh, you just guessed and got the answer right, okay? But as far as we are concerned, if at the end, the end product is verifiable, then we don't care whether we have reached it by a random process or not. Once we have found the solution, we verify it and then we are happy, okay? But there are problems where the algorithm gives an answer and then you ask the algorithm, are you sure? It says I'm 99% sure, okay? Now there, you have to be perhaps, you know, yeah, you have to accept reality and say, I am ready to live with 10% of error. This is not one of those problems. The only thing that can go wrong here is sometimes it might take very long. But when it gives the answer, the answer is correct. 
So both kinds of randomized algorithms exist. Okay, question. So this uh, superiority of the random algorithm, yes. does it rely on their uh, rely on the distributions of the sizes having some form or no. if I have some funny distribution where there are lots of nuts with very small sizes and a few nuts with Nothing. very large sizes. Yeah, so independent of the sizes of the nut, only promise is that they are all distinct sizes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they could be of any sizes, it will always take n log n. In fact, the, yeah, the problem works only by comparing them. It doesn't look at the actual values of the nuts. Okay. It just uses the fact which one is bigger, which one is smaller. Because the one that I sort of suggested, you compare them, if the blue is smaller, keep it on this side. If the blue is bigger, keep it on this side. Mm -hmm. And once you have found the match for this, do the same thing for the reds. And then you give this to one person and give this to another person. So in fact, this has scope for parallelization. If you had, after the first time, you have split it into two sub-problems and the two sub-problems can be solved independently. Okay, so question. Yeah. Is there a limit that for how do you uh, classify these into three different buckets? So too small, just right, too big. No, no, so no, no, oh, no, no, I, sorry. Is the, there a bucket size which you can no, specify? No, 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 my, my use of terminology was uh, wrong. Okay. So you picked a random bolt. Okay. If you say, if you find a nut which is big, you call it too big. I just use the word too big unnecessarily. I should have said big, match and small. Too big is not like, you know, I'm ready to tolerate a certain amount of bigness beyond which I'm not able to. Not Anything big, big is bigger, too oh, big okay. for this right. and too small for this. Right. Okay, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was unfortunate. Yeah, yeah confused. <laughs> All right. Uh, so one last application of randomness and See, the point I'm making is that sometimes randomness helps in simplifying the problem and you need the weight of rather famous people to do it deterministically, yeah? But there is always a good randomized solution. So, but nevertheless, this says that something that could be done randomly was also possible deterministically. But there are situations where randomness is absolutely essential, okay? And this, appears like most starkly in the area of cryptography. So I want to give you an example of that before we close. Okay. So, so here is a Sudoku puzzle. And I don't know whether it's hard or easy. I just found it on the net and it was easy to <laughs> include in the slides. But I have a, so I give it to you and you are worried. You feel I'm just cheating and making you waste your time. This puzzle probably has no solution at all. So now I want to convince you that this puzzle has a solution. But one thing I could do is give you the solution. But no, I want to convince you that this puzzle has a solution without giving you the solution. Now, I would like you to imagine for a moment, how could this even be possible? I have put this puzzle in front of you. I am claiming it has a solution, but I don't want to give you the solution, but somehow help you get convinced that it has a solution, okay? Um, furthermore, I want to convince you in a way so that you get no hint at all, okay? So it is not as if you say, okay, what's your solution? Okay, what will you put in the first column? And then I very tamely give you what is there in the first column. Then you at least got part of the solution. I don't want to give you anything about the solution, not even one bit of information, okay? But as a reasonable person, after our interaction, so this is in the area of interactive proofs. So we are used to old fashioned proofs where proofs are written on paper. Some referee comes, checks it, and once they have checked it, there is no doubt. And this very same proof can be handed over to the other referee and they will also be convinced. But the kind of proof that I'm going to describe to you now is a sort of proof where by the laws of probability, 
you are pretty certain that the claim I am making is true and you are ready to bet and swear by it. But then when you, someone else asks you, okay, do you believe that this problem has a solution? You say yes. Why? Because I just was convinced by this person. Okay, convince me now. You will be powerless. You are convinced that it is true, but you have no ability to convince another person of the truth of the statement. Okay, such proofs are called zero knowledge proofs. Okay, it is not zero knowledge, it is that just one bit of information that this particular puzzle has a solution. Okay, that is it. Question. Are you trying to convince them that you know a solution? No, at the moment I am only interested in convince, convincing the other person that there is a solution. But I, the protocol that I am going to explain <laughs> requires me to know the solution, okay, yeah, yeah. So I know the solution and I want to convince you that there is a solution without giving you any information about the solution, okay. So here is the protocol, yeah, so I do not have any more slides. So you see. Here is what I have done, um, okay, sorry, maybe I have one more slide, no, okay, yeah, ah, I forgot it, yeah, so here is the puzzle, yeah, here is the puzzle um, and I have claimed to you that I have actually got the solution at the back, please do not try to live, okay, yeah, so there is, okay, so now you cannot see through it, yeah. So there is a solution here, uh, I say that I have written the solution at the back. Now you are suspicious, you do not believe me or you have reasons to be suspicious. So you say, okay, convince me that there is solution, a proper solution written at the back. So I say, okay, what does it mean for there to be a solution? What is Sudoku? What does it mean for it? There are three kinds of constraints. Every row must have all nine digits. Every column must have all nine digits. And every one of these boxes should have all nine digits. Okay? There are only three constraints. So here is what you do to convince yourself. I have committed the value, I have written the values here, okay. Then you with you toss a coin, not a coin, a three way die and with probability one third you try to check whether my row statements were correct or not. With probability one third you check whether the column statements were correct or not or with probability one third you try to check whether the box statements were correct or not. Is this clear? There are three kinds of constraints, yeah and you suspect that one of those constraints is not working. Yeah, I have put a bogus solution at the back. Okay. So I ask you, okay, which one do you want to verify? You say, oh, I want, please show me that all the row constraints are satisfied. Now I could of course strip up all the rows, flip it around and give it to you, but that's a disaster. You will know the solution, yeah, because most of the rows are basically, the, you can tell them apart and you will know the solution immediately. But here is what I am going to do. I am going to cut these rows, yeah. So you wanted to verify the row solution, right. I am going to cut the first row, second row into nine strips. Each of the strips I am going to further cut into little cells, pieces and hand you those nine numbers. Okay, so while you think about it, let me do it, yeah. So what am I planning to do? I am going to cut, so all this I do in front so that you know that I have not exchanged the sheet of paper with another sheet of paper. Okay. So this was the first row, but I do not hand you the first row, sorry. Yeah, so I have this first row, now I further split it into nine in front of you 
yeah, I have done nothing, I have just split it up into 9 pieces and uh, let me hand it to the person who trusts me the least. Uh, can you please check that all 9 digits come? <laughs> okay, so, so what should one expect, yeah? So one would expect that there would be these and those nines, so what, what is the thing he is verifying? He is verifying that all nine digits appear, furthermore these places where a digit nine has been written on the other side also I better write nine, yeah? So once he has verified this for the first row, then I do this for the second row, third row, etc. Now, yeah, yeah, so, okay, good, yeah, this, this time, so there is a, uh, there is a quote, I don't know, where, one of Shakespeare's plays, like, I'm not naturally honest, but sometimes I'm honest by chance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, anyway, so you see, but he received this and has he received, so I would like you to think, once you get this set of nine numbers where behind six, sorry, behind nine there was a nine, behind one there was a one, behind five there was a five, behind two there was a two, okay? So it, I have, that means on the other side the nine digits appeared and they were aligned correctly, okay? That's it. And then I do it for this. So once I give you all this, uh, you have to be convinced that all these rows were correct. But then you might say that maybe the columns were a problem, yeah? So you say, okay, no, no, maybe the solution or the bogus solution you had was fine for rows, but it was the column constraints that were the problem. So I said, no problem, I have another sheet, would you like me to do this for the column, okay? So now it could be that the second time, I'm picking up a sheet where the columns are nicely done and the rows are messed, but that's not the way it works. You tell me, first you pick up the sheet, then I will tell you whether I want the rows checked or the columns checked or the boxes checked. The order is important, yeah? If you tell me first whether you are going to check the rows or not, or columns or the squares, I will doctor, I will pick up the right sheet like a magician usually cheats you. Here I commit, I commit in advance to this sheet of paper, yeah? And now you decide with probability one third whether it should be rows, columns or the squares. So if this was a bogus solution, then what's the probability that you'll catch me? At least, at least one third. Because if it was a bogus solution, either the row constraints or the column constraints or the square constraints were failing. And when you happen to challenge me on that weakness of my solution, you will catch me because I'm doing everything transparent, okay? Okay, maybe you said, okay, this man escaped with probability one third. You repeat it. Each time you picked it up. When I picked up the sheet, I didn't know which question you are going to ask. So the probability that I succeed after 10 such trials is one over three to the power 10, okay? Yeah, so if I hadn't been an on honest person and the chances that each time you would be unlucky and pick the particular constraint that is satisfied and fail to pick the one that is very small, okay? So I hope, I don't know if how convincing I was and just by shouting I cannot convince every, but uh, the, so you, yeah, so I'm hoping you're convinced that this is a reasonable method that if I didn't have a solution, you would have caught me, I, if I, especially if I did 10 trials. Question. Nine times in each way. No, no, no. He can, he can, he can keep it. He can. No, 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 no. The, no, the, 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 my purpose in life is just to convince him that this Sudoku has a solution. Okay. So I pick up a sheet of paper. I claim that I have a solution at the back. Invite him to choose row, 
column or cell. Three words he has to utter, one of those three words. If he says row, I strip up all the rows, chop up the rows further. So, sorry, first row I keep here, second row here, then chop up the first row, give that as a separate set, second row as a separate set, third row as a separate set. Nine such sets I give you. He does. Next time he says, okay, you know, this time you might have been lucky. I say, okay, try me again. And then I pick up another sheet. It could be that the Sudoku had multiple solutions. And this time I have him using a different solution. No problem. But if, as long as there is a solution, it is fine. But if there was no solution, he would have caught me with probability one third. Okay, so at least one thing is being done without, so the, yeah, so I'm at least convincing you that there is a solution. Have I leaked some information about, so suppose, yeah, so one of you, you did this interaction with me and did it 10 times and each of the 10 times I was able to give you satisfactory uh, piles of little chits of paper. Then you go home and uh, you take this puzzle and uh, show it to your mother and say, look, solve this. Mother says, why should I trust that you have, uh, this is solvable. So you say, look, I have these little piles of chits. Yeah, they convince me. Shouldn't they convince you? Mother says, what is this chit corresponding to the first row? I don't even need to know the solution to produce this chit. It has nine numbers. Each of these nines has a nine on the other side. Rest of them have black on one side and the remaining digits on the other side. So I didn't even have to interact with this, your master Sudoku solver to get this. How am I going to be convinced by this? Okay. So this is the way zero knowledge proofs are usually kind of proved to be correct. That is any distribution of chits or any distribution of data that you have obtained in interaction with me, you could have generated yourself. If you knew that this interaction is successful, then there is a slip of paper. If in the second round you had done a column thing, you know exactly what I am going to give you. Yeah? Sorry, didn't end. No. So I have the solution. Yes, that's right. No, no, I'm saying that the fact that you have now convinced that I have the solution, you are now not able to go and tell another person, convince them that this Sudoku has a solution. This is not true of normal proofs. I mean, if you prove some famous theorem and show me the proof or convince me, I can walk away with that proof and catch somebody on the road and tell them that, look, this theorem is true. And this theorem is true because here is the proof. But this is some funny sort of proof. I gave you this pile of papers, it convinced you, at least after 10 rounds, that I have a solution. But those piles of paper, whatever, or entire recollection, memory of our interaction, nothing allows you to prove to another person that this very Sudoku has a solution other than solving it yourself. So, yes. 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 Yes, you can. No. No. Each pile. No, no, I'm claiming, no, I'm claiming that no amount. No, I, but, sorry, question. I think, I think the proof is, uh, uh, is, is, the convincing is in the actual interaction. Any artifacts coming out of that isn't going to be useful. That's what you're trying to say. Right? That's what I'm trying to say, but let me try and answer. So you suspect that if I, if I had given you the strips of the rows, but chopped up. Yeah, nine, nine, nine. 999, nine. so you got 18, 18 of them, 18 little piles, 9 for the rows, 9 for the column. And also 9 for the boxes. Okay, you got 9 for the boxes also. And I keep them separately. Yes. I don't mix it up. I you don't, yeah, you keep them separately. 9 is for the rows, 9 is for the columns. Then I can get it. Okay, so here, okay, so here is what I am telling you. What does the first pile corresponding to the rows look like? Once, it is 9 numbers. Huh with these numbers printed on both sides. Correct. So why do you need me? You could have made that pile yourself. No, once I have the problem sheet and I have this 999, 
I have the answer. No, you don't. I have to do some jugglery, but I'll get the answer. <laughs> yeah, so you have a, a way of a con convincing. Uh, let's say I have, I give you a Sudoku, which doesn't have a solution. And now, even for that, I can produce a proof exactly like that. For each row, I can give you uh, numbers that are going to be from 1 to 9. And for some are going to blank on one side, the other has a number. And the others will have the same number on both sides. Okay. If I give you piles of that sort, the Sudoku doesn't have a solution. But that the proof, it still looks the same. No, no. Let, let me just convince you. Suppose I, I gave you the pile for, just give me one more chance. No, so, no, so suppose, no, no, for example, look at the first pile. So I stripped this, I cut this uh, into half. And then I got this pile, and there were these nine piles. Okay. And while you are going home, you happen to have dropped the first pile and lost it. Yeah? Then you are worried, like, you just made a statement that if you had all 18, uh, 27 of them, you would have, but the first pile is lost. My claim is, that you look at this Sudoku and you will know what that pi first pile was. That first pile was blank followed by with a, another number other than 9, 1, 5, 2 in it. Another strip was 9 with 9. Another one was a blank with one of the numbers. The numbers that don't appear here appear with a blank on one side and the numbers that appear here have the same number on the other side. So you could have created that yourself. So that means the first rows pile, if you believe me, if you had dropped it, you would still have been able to manage second row, same logic. That means if you had dropped all the nine on the, your way home, you could still have solved the problem. So if I continue like this, that means if you had dropped everything I gave you, you could have still solved the problem. That means the problem after this interaction is no easier than it was in the beginning. Okay. This is, I mean, I don't know. You're not going to. Okay, all right. No, no, th th I admit I, there is a solution. I mean, there is a solution because at this stage I can show it to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, he, he says that after some effort you will be able. No, the point is that of course you will be able to put, I mean, there is a solution. The question is, does this interaction make it any easier than without interaction. No, no, but then that, the moment you know that there is a solution, with enough jugglery, you can find it. That statement was always true, okay? What extra did you gain by interacting with me? Okay. You can throw it away and with extra jugglery, because these 27 sheets you could have, uh, uh, piles you could have generated yourself, because by just thinking, that, oh, this first pile would look like this, the second pile would look like this. You know the structure, the content, the nature of every single pile ahead of time. The information is not in the pile. It was in the order which he destroyed and then gave you the pile. Yes, there was a certain... The information com was not in the pile. It was in the initial order in each row which, which he has destroyed that before giving you. There is a commitment. There is a word called, like, I am committing. The fact that I have put this data doesn't allow me to change it. Suppose I was some funny magician, I wrote something, and the moment you asked some row, row constraints, I did move my hands like this, and they suddenly form. If I had those powers, then this is not a proof. The fact that I don't, my weakness, my inability, laws of physics don't permit me to change the ink on the fly, that nature of commitment is what makes you convinced at the end that the Sudoku had a solution, okay? Uh, now the word commitment has been used. So now all this is fine with paper, etc. But suppose a particular interaction has to take place between a computer and another to verify some fact, like a password. Are there going to be pieces of paper that the little computer is going to chop up, etc.? No, but this idea, just like the idea here, of a certain physical experiment which translated into an algorithm. An idea like this translates into cryptographic protocol and precisely the word commitment. Is it possible for us to electronically commit to something? That is, I say 
that here is this long number, I give it to you and this is going to be my choice for the next election, okay? But I have committed, yeah? Then at a later time, you ask me to reveal its value, okay? I give you the password or something, but while giving you the password, I should not be able to trick you and change, make you conclude that I had committed to something else, okay? So I had said that I have committed to the solution here and in the process of cutting, I should not be able to change it, okay? Are there cryptographic methods, yeah, that allow us to do this? The answer is yes and they are based on hardness of problems. So it is the hardness of certain functions, certain activities that make certain other activities feasible. The hardness of changing the data on the fly allows me to convince you easily, okay? So this is the spirit of many things in modern cryptography. I'm basically done, but I'll take a question. There is one already. Yeah. yeah. So for a cryptographic algorithm to uh, have a, uh, a certain level of uh, trust that information that is being exchanged is proper, they can always go via single uh, way hash functions. We need not go via these, which will be, I think, more difficult to implement and to do it. We can simply create a single hash function and then we can use that. That that guarantees yeah. that whatever I reveal later on and what has been shared. Yeah, but uh, see there is, uh, no, so just yeah. I agree that uh, no, hash functions, which I have not discussed at all, will play a role. But the point is that if I have told you what is going to be in the first row, okay, and I encode it using a hash function and I've committed to it, okay, but while at some point you're going to challenge me and say, show me that the row constraints hold. What do I give you so that it only tells me that all nine letters appeared in the first row and without revealing you that the first one was a one, the first one was a seven, the third one was a four or something like that. So I should, so th there are methods to do this, but just a simple hashing wouldn't do the job. So basically we're looking over here to reveal a part of the solution. Or a permutation of the solution. Or a permutation solution. Yeah. With, so I commit to the fact that what I am revealing you late, revealing you to late, uh, revealing to you later, mm -hmm. is a permutation of what I have in mind. Yeah. But I don't want you to know what I had in mind initially. In the same way, I had a solution here at the back of this sheet. What I reveal to you is a jumbled up pile of uh, slips. It convinces you that I haven't added a new thing or taken out a new thing, but it doesn't tell you in which order they appeared originally, okay? We will need a device to achieve this cryptographically and it can be done, okay? Question. One final question. No, please. Uh, I have heard somewhere uh, in some of my previous textbooks that to get a pure form of randomness from a computing algorithm yes. is next to impossible. Yes. If you have the time, can you tell, explain why that is so? I mean, See, so there are, uh, as you said, some philosophical questions about what is randomness, okay? So if randomness is equated, at least computationally, with unpredictability, okay? That is, something is random because I'm not able to predict it, okay? Randomness is a slightly deeper concept, but from a functional point of view, if I'm not able to predict something that is as good as random, okay? Now, there are hypotheses in computing which say that there are certain functions which are hard to compute, sorry, easy to compute, but hard to invert, okay? So what we do is we substitute hardness for randomness in many of these protocols. We say that I don't care whether it is truly random, yeah, but no efficient computation will be able to distinguish what I am giving you from truly random, okay? And that is based on hypothesis about the hardness of certain functions. So that is one answer. The other answer, probably closer to Tithadi's heart, is that there is true randomness in quantum, okay? So, yeah, so if you, you know, polarize a photon and measure it somehow, it will come out random, okay? There will be noise, there will be adjustment, etc. needed. But that is not the way randomness is used in computation today. Yeah. So there are 
hypotheses and assumptions about random number generators and we basically go by the fact that we believe somehow that no efficient algorithm can distinguish these from truly random. So whenever the algorithm needs uh, a random bit, it would do equally well with this pseudo random bit. Question. Uh, sir, uh, I was a little bit confused on uh, why we had that initial one third probability. Like, couldn't we make three copies of it and like reveal all the row file, column file, and box perfect, file? Perfect, perfect. And so, yeah. So, if I made three copies, yeah. Now, and I know that the first one you are going to ask the row, second one the column, third one. So, I doctor the first solution so that it is perfectly good on the rows, but in bombs on the columns. The second sheet is perfectly, it's not the same solution. I'm a cheater, yeah, I'm a cheat. Yeah, I'm trying to convince you that there is a solution when there is no solution. But I know that you are going to do this. That is in the first you are going to ask the row, in the second one you are going to ask the column, in the third one you are going to ask the score, yeah, or the squares. Then I make the first solution which is very nice in rows, but a mess in columns. But I know that you are not going to ask for columns in the first one, okay. That's the problem, so here, I am asked to hold the solution first and then you will randomly choose one of the three. So no matter where I have hidden my blemish, either in the rows, columns or the squares, with one third probability you will catch it. Question. What if I make it more difficult for you and I say that you have to photocopy it in front of me. Yes. And then I ask you to make three photocopies and then I just say that okay, you know, that you know. I'll, in one of the copies you show that the row is fine, other one you show that the column is fine, and the last one you show that the boxes are fine. So then I won't need any randomness, right? Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, the, yeah. The, no, but I think I agree with you. If I could, fo if I'm allowed to photocopy and the photocopier doesn't have a little printer hidden inside it, mm -hmm. then it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you. No, no, please go. Yeah, so in the end, these random bits we are going to feed to a computation. And we are also told that it's an efficient computation. That means your program is not going to run for very long, okay? So now, here is a program which takes some random bits and produces an answer. Maybe this is a program for playing in the stock market. Okay, but it is taking some random bits in order to compute some answer, okay. And ideally, I would have liked to toss coins and feed the outcomes here, okay. But you don't have coins inside your computer, you have something else. So, instead, you feed it some strings from a distribution, which is probably not truly random, okay. But suppose I have hypothesis that no small program no small program can, dis can differentiate between this distribution and this distribution. Then, okay, so, so this is the hypothesis you work in. So there are some problems which are obtained by mangling number theory and things like that. So that you know that if you're given a particular number, you can produce the output. But given the output, trying to find out which input it came from is very hard. So using such hard functions, you can generate such a thing that is the output of this. Not the same, so what we are interested in is the distribution, distribution of the output. Yes, the distribution of the output will be very similar. Yeah. The, no algorithm which runs in less than n squared time can
can tell the difference between this string and this string with probability better than one in a million. Statements like this are hardness statements. That is, this is indistinguishable from the other true thing in by means of a short computation. It, sorry, there was a question I, here. Yes. Yes. So, uh, what are the practical applications of such a let's say zero knowledge proof? Oh, uh, everywhere now. Yeah, the whole Bitcoin industry is based on this. Okay. So, before making a purchase nowadays, what do you do? You, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, you need a bank statement showing that you have funds. Yeah. So the person in the office knows exactly how rich you are. Yeah. And knows, you know, how much money you have, etc. With all these bitcoins, using zero knowledge protocol, I can convince you that I have enough money to buy this house, which I ought to because otherwise you won't even bother. Other than that, I reveal no other information. Other than that one bit of information that I have sufficient money. Okay. So my computer will interact with your computer by means of a protocol which instead of scissors and paper will have cryptographic primitives embedded inside it and in the end it will be convinced that I have the sufficient amount of money in bitcoins. Okay. Passwords. Yeah. So I want to send, I want to do an interaction with a computer to inform it that I have the password but I don't want to reveal the password because maybe somebody is eavesdropping and they will pick up the password. Of course, you can send it encrypted and things like that. But you could also have a zero knowledge protocol. I convince the computer that I know the password without revealing it the password. Right. Thank you. There uh, was a question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my question is actually a follow up for this. Like, uh, yeah, so to prove my identity to someone and uh, without sharing my password, uh, so this is used for that. But how? How do I prove without? I get the practical example, but how cryptographical? Yeah, so do we have time or what's the situation? I mean, I, this is the last question. I mean, what's. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Yeah, so uh, I mean the exact details of what, uh, uh, so here is the challenger and here is the prover and this prover is supposed to have that password, yeah, and he wants to prove to this challenger that they have a password, okay. So the challenger sends to a prover a certain identity of a little program okay, and say that compute that program on your password. That is feed your password to that program on your own computer and send me the result. Okay. And then the challenger who happens to know the expected password, it applies the same program and sees whether it matches. Okay. Now the chances that you will be able to match the expected solution without having the password will be very small, okay. So, but anybody who has observed this, he says that this fellow has sent some 10 digit number, okay. Using that 10 digit number, he will not be able to guess what the password was. It was some funny feature of the password, okay. So the next time the challenger, next time you try to log in, the challenger poses another challenge. It will not be the same challenge. So if somebody has eavesdropped and recorded the entire conversation and then feels very happy that they have cracked your password, next time they try to log in, the challenger asks something else. Some other random, it sends you a different program and says feed your input into this program and give me the answer. And now looking at the previous conversation, you have no idea what answer you should repeat, what answer you should send. Okay. So, now so I, that's the public key and private key. Yeah. That can be used, yeah. yeah. Sorry, so there is literature on the net. This, if you go to this website, yeah, uh, it has various things including um, how to deal with children who don't trust you and uh, yeah, so it's uh, useful for people of all age groups, so yeah. 
thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for staying till the end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jekumar, for the talk. There are a few online questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. One is, Vijay Panchal is asking, what is the application to know that I have the password without knowing my password yeah. when the whole point is checking my password? No. So, the whole point of password is to verify my identity. That is, I know the password, not to reveal the password. So, I think the purpose of password is so that an illegitimate person doesn't get access to some resource, okay? And I'm just uh, confirming that I'm a legitimate person and my legitimacy, le legitimacy is established by the fact that I have been given the password. So I just convince you that I have been given the password. Thank you. Uh, another question from Arun. Uh, this is regarding this, um, this experiment. experiment. Um, are we looking for good analogs from nature and apply those approaches within, within a traditional computational approach? I think. Yeah, so I mean, uh, when nature happens to solve some problems, I mean, like almost all physics problems, I mean, so there is, um, there are some laws of physics which, are, which, cause a certain result to be produced. And we would like to simulate it. We would like to say whether our computers, knowing the initial conditions, can also determine the same conclusion. So in those situations, of course, we have no choice. We have to look at nature, its laws, and ask how we can cleverly replicate its behavior. Okay, so that is one thing. But wherever it is possible, if there are natural processes which are achieving something, yeah, we would like to see how information moved around in those processes and try to replicate them. We don't always exactly simulate the underlying physics, but we get inspired by them. There are situations where both things happen. Thank you. If there are no further questions, then, then we can, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jaikumar, for the talk. And <clears throat> Thanks uh, everyone for coming. The next Kape with Curiosity talk will be on 26th March by Professor Amitabh Joshi. And he's going to talk about, the title of the talk is, What is Natural Se Selection and Why It Is Not the Survival of the Fittest? Thank you, see you in the next talk. <laughs>